What is general relativity? Okay, and um, what can I say? General relativity is a theory that's been around for over 100 years now. Um, it's a theory that says, in, in essence, that gravity is the warping of time. And you warp time, you warp the seconds, the minutes, the months, the years, whatever, and that's gravity. That's what it says in a nutshell. So once you know that, you're an expert in general relativity. And this comes from this fellow here um, who wrote a paper. It says, general relativity is a tensor field theory of gravitation with universal coupling to the particles and fields of the standard model, meaning quantum mechanics. It describes gravity as a universal deformation of the flat space-time. So you have flat space-time, right? You sink it, like I showed last week. And when you do, when you have that curvature, now you have gravity. That's it. That's the theory, okay? Theory in physics is very simple. It's uh, using words. We don't use equations. We don't uh, measure anything. We don't do any experiments. All we do is explain the theory, the mechanism. The mechanism is warp time, and okay? That's what these people are saying. And this is what they put out there, and this is what you know, the, many of the laymen believe because they say, well, these guys know all that math. They must know what they're doing. It turns out they don't. They have no explanation for gravity to this day, but these people talk as if they knew what they're talking about. Okay, so here we have, um, you know, we have uh, that it's a uh, tensor theory, but here we have more than that. It's not only a tensor theory of gravity, it's a metric theory of gravity. They justify it saying Einstein's equations de describe the relation between the geometry of a four-dimensional pseudo-Riemannian manifold representing space-time and the energy momentum contained in that space-time. It's also a mathematical theory of gravity. It's justified as follows. The mathematical code which encapsulates the entire theory of general relativity represents 16 equations, six of them duplicates, which define the nature of space, light, and travel in our universe. And it's also a geometric theory of gravity, and uh, we have the quotation of uh, John Wheeler says, space-time tells matter how to move, matter tells space-time how to curve. And it's also a field theory of gravity. You know, I don't know what kind of field, you know, it's a poppy field, uh, you know, who knows uh, what kind of fields they're talking about. So we got to look at this word field because it underlies all these concepts here, okay? And so, yeah, um, we need to get to the bottom of what general relativity is about. And uh, what it is about is all these words that they use. They say it's a field theory, a tensor theory, a mathematical theory. None of those are physical objects. We want to know what kind of physical object underlies the theory because they're going to talk about a mechanism of gravity. Especially today, we're going to be dealing with the, um, uh, what is it, with the um, tests, the confirmations of relativity. Mm -hmm. So what is a confirmation? Well, it means you're going to do some kind of test out there, you know, something. Anyways, uh, here we have uh, the, why it's a field theory. One fellow tells us in uh, the Stack Exchange, he says, mechanical theory. He wants to distinguish between the two. He says, a mechanical theory, theory which describes time evolution of a particle or a system of particles regardless of the fields affecting the particle system. In other words, he's saying it's irrelevant whether a field uh, touches the particle, right? They're just looking at the single particle moving through time, okay? Uh, through space time, through space, I don't know what word they want to put in there. Anyways, they say it's just a particle moving without indicating what effect the field has on the particle. On the other hand, a field theory is the opposite. It says a theory which describes Theory that which describes. I thought a theory was an explanation. And these people talk about descriptions immediately change the word to description because it's the only thing that mathematics can do. Describe. It has no power to explain. In fact, they've never been able to explain anything. Like Mary Poppins, you know, I never explain anything. And so it says a theory which describes time evolution of a particle or a system of particles taking the effect of fields on the particle or the system. Right, so he's looking at the effect of a field on the particle into account and describes time evolution of fields themselves. Okay? General relativity is clearly a field theory because the Einstein field equation, right, and there you have it, is an equation of motion for the field. 
okay? At each point in time, and the metric of space-time, which is position-dependent, has a field, is determined by the energy-matter distribution. Okay, so they're, they're looking at all this fuzziness out there that they don't understand, which is this word energy and this word field, and they say that affects whatever object moves through space-time. And what is space-time? Well, it's the energy and the field that they're talking about. <laughs> but saying that a rotating frame is not a uh, physical field is not a matter of choice. It's a coordinate-induced fictitious effect, not a physical field. A physical field? What are these people talking about? What is a physical field? Field is a concept. It's always been a concept. These people talk about physical fields, and of course they get all tangled in their own uh, semantics, their word salad. Uh, these people are saying that you have these uh, fields and that they're physical, whatever that means. Physical means that what, it, it can bring down a wall, a concept called a field, a region. Is that what a field is? Just a region of numbers? And so this is where the problem is. So we look at the word uh, field, and here it is, a quantity. That's what it is. A field is a quantity represented by a number that has value for each point in space and time. And then you have a breakdown of each one of those words, key keywords. Number, mathematical object, they call it. No, it's not an object. It's a concept. Value an indefinite mathematical object. No, it's not an object, it's a concept. Point an exact location in space, space-time, any mathematical model which fuses the three dimensions of space and uh, time. Space is the fundamental space. I love that one. That's a good definition. Space is the fundamental space. And time, the continued sequence of existence and events that occurs in re irreversible succession from the past, which is time, through the present, which is time, into the future, which is time again, okay? And irreversible, they've even reversed that, you know? <laughs> the irreversibility of time is now, all you have to do is put a negative sign in front, and then you have reversible time. They can do anything in math. In math, it's absolutely the world of wonders. You can do anything, cheat, lie, everything's accepted. Okay, so uh, we want to really understand what a field is, uh, at least uh, from a physics point of view, what were they talking about all these years? And, uh, you know, Faraday told us exactly, or more or less, what his notion of field was. He's the guy who invented the word, so hopefully we pay attention to him. And he says, I cannot conceive curves lines of force without the conditions of a physical existence in that intermediate space. In other words, the, inter the space is what he called the field, but he says there are these lines of force which are physical. And today they've gotten rid of all these lines of force and they say, well, those are not physical. We just use them to represent magnetism or whatever, right? And we have uh, good old Max there, Maxwell as well. He, he also says the following. He says, feel the space in the neighborhood of the electric and magnetic bodies. In that space, there is matter in motion. Matter in motion. Okay, so uh, field is a region where there is matter in motion. That's what it means from a physical point of view. From a mathematical point of view, uh, matter in motion is just, uh, I mean, it's just a bunch of numbers. Field is just a bunch of numbers, okay, it's, uh, with units. And they get weaker the farther away you get from ground zero. So you're talking about gravitational field, it just gets weaker. You're talking about a magnetic field or electric field, it just gets weaker as you get farther out. That's all it is. So it's just a region of numbers. Okay, that's all it is. Okay, so here, let me uh, illustrate for you what a field is. Okay, watch carefully. Here it goes. You have this fellow and you're jumping around. Okay, and the field is what? What is the field? The field is the region. The rope is the object, not the, not the region. Okay, the object is rope. And that's what Maxwell and Faraday were referring to. Okay, and uh, and yeah, the region is what is just a uh, is what we call the field. And so this is where the problem is, you know, that all these people uh, never never understood that that a region between two magnets, for example, right? Uh, it's got something in there, some physical object that which that we cannot see or touch. Therefore, it's no use going to the lab and trying to figure out what that is. The only way to figure that out is sit it. In your office, put your feet on top of your desk, beer on the right hand, beautiful girl on the left hand for, you know, uh, inspiration. <laughs>
And you think, you have to think and try to visualize what could be in that region. You're not going to go to the lab and figure out magnetism. There's no way you can touch it or see it. So why are you wasting your time? You know, we've already done all, a million experiments uh, with regard to magnetism and gravity, and they never figured it out. Why? Because they never figured out that they have to put an object in there, an invisible, intangible object. And it had better be invisible or intangible, because if you make it visible or tangible, you know, and uh, uh, like you say, hey, I proved it in the lab. I was able to touch it with my hand, you know, uh, touch me hands. Uh, no, you, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot touch it. If you touched it, for sure, for sure, it's not what Mother Nature has out there. For sure, it's not the so-called field, or better yet, the mediator of the field. The field is the region, whatever's moving in there, whatever physical object in there is in there, you cannot see or touch. So you cannot go to the lab, you cannot say, I experimentally proved what it's, what's in there. You can't do that. You can only visualize it. You can try to imagine it, that's it. And a lot of people don't understand that. In fact, uh, all the mathematicians ever since, you know, Pythagoras all the way to today, never figure that out, that, that you need to put an object in there and that you cannot run an experiment. You have to imagine, you have to visualize it. Okay, uh, here we have um, this, uh, confirmations of uh, good old Einstein. That's what we're going to look into today now that we've looked at the introduction there for what a uh, what general relativity is. It's got to do with this thing called space-time. They're going to try to confirm it. And the first thing we need to mention is that they're not going to confirm it in a lab or a field. Okay, They can't do field work or go out there in a... Uh, in, in the universe and say, oh, uh, we've confirmed the field. Now, you can't confirm the field. You cannot prove the field. You cannot detect the field. All you can detect is that which is tangible or visible. And so it's no use going to the lab or field, which is the way they intend. This is, these are the confirmations, the tests, the proven tests of relativity are the ones they boast about um, that they ran to confirm general relativity, meaning that space-time is real. Okay, that's, that's what they've done here. And so you cannot use your eyes or hands because we're not going to the lab or to the field. You can't see or touch that which is invisible and intangible. And uh, you know, certainly you can't uh, detect concepts. You know, these people go in there and they use words like field and energy, and these are concepts. And they never realize this. You know, time, it's a concept. Uh, how, you, how do you plan to detect time? You know, with a clock? <laughs> catch, catch the minutes and seconds with a clock? Is that how you do it? And uh, so all the confirmations or alleged confirmations of general relativity are indirect. They're, uh, uh, they're inferred, okay? Because you can measure the visible, but you can only infer uh, the invisible and intangible. And so all the confirmations of GR are based on irrational assumptions about the mediator. Why are they irrational? Because they are all abstract mathematical concepts, which they treat as objects, and they say, oh, we've confirmed the field. How did you confirm the field? How did you confirm the wave? How did you confirm space-time? If all these are concepts, that's the problem. What did we say the other day, uh, last week? Uh, space-time, what is it? A bunch of number lines. That's all it is. And so to say that you are able to confirm through an experiment that the number lines warped, you know, you can do that you can explain a theory at best, right, that you warp the number lines. That's already irrational. But to say that you went to the field, you know, out there in space, and that you actually proved the existence of warped number lines, now that's getting even, you know, deeper. You, you, you really fell into a rabbit hole there, okay? Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, how are we going to prove it? Well, let me show you an analogy how these people done it, okay? And you go to the friend's house, okay? you go to a friend's house, and you see this. You see a curtain moving. And your friend tells you, oh, by the way, you know, um, what you're staring at there is, um, is uh, my grandmother moving the, uh, the curtain. Oh, is your grandmother in the room? Oh, you bet she is. She died uh, many years ago. Oh, 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 I see. Ah, you, she died many years ago, and she's moving the, uh, the curtain. 
Well, yeah, I mean, uh, this was her house and she doesn't want us to sell it. She always said that. And so, uh, you know, she comes every now and then, moves the curtains uh, to let us know that she's watching. Okay. And how do you know it's your grandmother that's who? Maybe, maybe if you close the windows, you know? She says, well, what else can it be? Okay, what else can it be if not my grandmother? This is a haunted house. And so this is more or less the argument that uh, you're going to see here throughout. This is the argument. These are the arguments that they raise, that uh, the relativists raise on how they proved general relativity, space time, and all these good things, black holes, and etc. Okay. And so um, here's a summary of the first three tests that Einstein proposed. Okay. Comes out of the Wikipedia. Albert Einstein proposed three tests of general relativity, subsequently called the classical tests of general relativity in 1916. He suggested the perihelion precession of Mercury's orbit, the deflection of light by the sun, and the gravitational redshift of light. Those three were the, uh, you know, the uh, predictions, as they call them in mathematics. The predictions. And if they, these predictions came out to be true, well, then you've proven, right? And Einstein added, this is in a letter he sent to someone, I think he sent it to the, uh, I think it was to, uh, pre to the press, to the newsman. If a single one of the conclusions drawn from it proves wrong, it must be given up. To modify it without destroying the whole structure seems to be impossible. In other words, uh, he was raising the stakes, he's saying, it's all or none. I'm going to put all three of them in there. It's got to be all three or none of the three. And uh, so, you know, it was like he was putting his name on the line that if all three turn out to be true, well, uh, he obviously uh, was right, correct. He proved relativity, uh, space time, whatever, right? Okay, let's go with one of the first ones here. Uh, this one is uh, the light bending, okay? And uh, some of you have seen this in the past. But let's, uh, let's just illustrate it. Here goes. Okay, that's light bending. You can see a star behind the sun during an eclipse. Okay, you can see the light of that star. So you say, well, light must have bent around the sun and the moon and come to your eye. Okay, and um, well, there's a couple things we talked about in the last couple weeks about this. So let's go through them real quick. The first one is the double slit experiment. Also the bending of light, but they don't call it the bending of light here for some reason. Uh, partly because it's not done with mass. It's not a gravitational effect. They say this is an interference effect. And uh, the way they, they, they could explain it more or less with uh, waves, they have a mechanism. The problem with waves is there is no such thing as a wave. They cannot explain it with particles, and the way they explain it is saying that well, a particle can be anywhere, and so if it can be anywhere, then uh, obviously it can be anywhere on the wall. The only problem with that is that um, if the particle can be anywhere at random, you would not get those specific fringes every single time and uh, consistently. You, would get, you, you could get them everywhere, all these particles everywhere. And that's not what they say. They just show this uh, and say, see, we did it with particles. Uh, we just said that the particle can be anywhere at once. They interfere with each other, and that's how they made the fringes. And we don't have to do any of that. We uh, take a little bit of both. Uh, we like the wave explanation, and we say that if we have a rope tied from every atom from the flashlight or the laser pointer or whatever, and we point at a needle, okay, we don't have to turn any corner because every atom in the needle, at the edge of the needle, is connected to every atom in the, in the flashlight, and every atom in the edge of the needle is connected to every atom on the wall. Okay, so now we have interference pattern, there you see it, okay? And uh, no problem with that, you know. Uh, as I explained the other day, all you have to do is you, you can simulate it with your hands, right? And you have your hands, let's see if I can do this, like this. 
And if you move your hand to one side, right, let's do it the other direction, like that, you can see how they slide with respect to each other. What does that mean? That they can be offset by half a link or whatever, and that's why you see the fringes. You have destructive interference and constructive interference with a rope. And what you and I've explained that in the past, you have the atoms pumping at a different rate for things that go below the visible range and things that go up, uh, in the visible range, which is why we see these fringes. Okay, anyways, um, here we have um, uh, Andromeda, you know. I've shown this in the past. If, uh, if uh, light bends, first you've got to tell me what light is. And the question is, you know, if light is made of uh, photons like that, or if made of a single piece that extends from Andromeda all the way down here. Otherwise, you have to tell me where the uh, photon begins, where the photon ends. Okay, are we saying that we have a series of photons, one right after another, coming towards Earth? all the way from Andromeda, or are we saying that it extends? And so, yeah, the nature, of, the physical nature of the mediator of light is very important in this case, because you have to tell us, you know, uh, there's no such thing as a wave, so you have to tell us what the wave is made of. And uh, particles, you cannot, uh, discrete particles, you cannot explain this phenomenon, um, because again, you know, you have one right after another. First, a uh, series of particles can never travel straight. That's the first problem, and I explained that the other day. And then, uh, and then the question is, you know, you have one right after another. Where, it, where does a particle stop? Where does it end? You know, where does it start and where does it end? You have to uh, identify all this before you can use your do your theory. But then, uh, this has to do with bending of light. Uh, one in the case in the case of the slit, it, they just say it, it does so. They don't know how how it's bent. They can't do it with waves. They can't do it with particles. They just say it is so. So they don't have an explanation really of why the fringes are there. But it's not a gravitational phenomenon. It's not a mass related phenomenon. On the other hand, uh, anything that is out there, you know, in space, that is alleged to be a mass slash gravitational phenomenon. Okay. And so, what's the issue? Let's debunk that. Debunk? Did I say debunk? No, we don't debunk in science. All we can do is show you the irrationality of what uh, general relativity proposes. And here it is. Here we have a laser, right? We're going to point it at a mirror, and that mirror uh, reflects it back to another mirror behind the laser. And we can do this in different ways, but this is just one setup, okay? So here's Bill Gates' experiment that uh, show the irrationality of what uh, general relativity proposes. Okay, we have this, right? And now what happens? Well, uh, they say that mass bends or warps light. Okay, so let's put a bunch of trucks, okay, on one side of that uh, beam full of all kinds of garbage. I mean, we can put tons in there, as much as you want. And it should deflect the beam a little bit, at least, right here on Earth. And so the question is, if uh, we do this experiment, will it really bend the beam? Let me make a prediction for you. <laughs> now, we don't do predictions in science, but uh, these idiots, you know, they talk about predictions. Okay, let me predict that light will not be bent by mass. Okay, put as many kilograms, as many tons as you want on those trucks. You know, fill them with... Uh, landfill, whatever you want, garbage, and uh, it will not bend the beam, okay? Only these mentally retarded mathematicians talk about the bending of light, okay? Rope, stretch tight, can't bend it, no way. But there's a, also another way of showing this. Uh, you don't have to get a whole bunch of trucks full of garbage, right, to do this. A uh, much easier way, uh, you can do it today, you can buy a couple uh, mirrors, right, out there, and uh, do the experiment known as ray reversibility, the principle of ray reversibility of optics, and uh, one that uh, cannot be assaulted at all, okay, and that is that light retraces its exact path, okay, so when you send it through a prism into a mirror, then back, the light always travels in the same exact path. That's impossible with particles, because the entire planet moved, uh, the room moved, the universe moved, the uh, 
you know, uh, what is it, the, the sun moved, everything moved. Certainly, uh, uh, you move uh, with respect to the particles which are suspended in air, so to speak. You know, the particles have no reason to stay uh, their course. There should be a curvature there, and it's not. It's always done with straight lines. And so uh, here it's a little exaggerated just to show the point. And the point is that, you know, light always retraces its exact path. And, you know, these, all these folks, they talk very little about these experiments that have been done for a long time. These are observations that are no longer in question. And, uh, yeah, this debunks any notion that light can be bent, okay? Especially, or that light is even made of discrete particles. It can't be made of discrete particles because that's what would happen if they were made of discrete particles, photons, whatever you want to call them. You know, they can never travel straight, one right after another. They would swerve. They would, uh, uh, they would trace a curvilinear path through space, through the region. Okay, so here we have uh, another one of these classical confirmations. It's the gravitational redshift. And uh, this was a couple of guys who did an experiment over there at the Harvard Tower. Famous one says, so consider a falling object, its speed increases as it is falling. Hence, if we were to associate a frequency with that object, the frequency should increase accordingly as it falls to Earth. We should observe the same effect for light. So let's shine a light beam from the top of a very tall building. If we can measure the frequency shift as the light beam descends the building, right, we should be able to discern how gravity affects the falling light beam. In other words, they're saying that gravity whatever that is, right, mass, right, there's more mass in the, towards the bottom of the uh, earth, than, I mean, on the surface of the earth than up, you know, in space, that's what they're saying, so gravity is going to affect light, light is going to uh, suffer uh, some, uh, uh, what is it, frequency change, simply be, as it approaches uh, a mass, uh, or bigger mass, okay, so if we can measure the frequency shift as the light beam descend the building, we should be able to discern how gravity affects the falling light beam. Pound and Rebka shown a light from the top of Jefferson Tower at Harvard and measured the frequency shift. The frequency shift was tiny, but in agreement with a theoretical prediction, consider a light beam that is traveling away from a gravitational field. Now we're going to go in the opposite direction. Okay, we're going to go out, out of the Earth. Its frequency should shift to lower values. In other words, the uh, frequency should be less, right? This is known as the gravitational redshift of light. The gravitational redshift implies that space is curved. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't imply that space is curved. What's curved is uh, your mind. It's warped. You got a warped mind, okay? And so, yeah, we can do it very easily with a rope model. And here's uh, an example, okay? As the ropes extend from every atom on Earth outwards, uh, we would expect eventually the ropes to uh, have uh, lower frequency and longer wavelengths, okay? So the frequency coming out of the sun is very high, but as it go, travels down to Earth, towards the middle between the Earth and the sun, the frequency should be, uh, what is it, um, you know, the, in other words, the wavelength should be longer uh, the farther away it is from the sun and from the earth and it should be um, uh, lower frequency okay so that's what we should see in the middle between the earth and the sun and you can do this with a rope at your home you can uh, tie it to uh, the wall to, to, to you know from one wall to another very tight okay and no matter how tight, and it's better to do it a much longer uh, distance. You know, you can do it at home, but it's much better to do it, you know, uh, a couple kilometers if you can. And what you will note is that as tight as you have it right at the edges, that means uh, torqued to, um, to a high frequency, in other words, many links and shorter links, as you go out, the links will tend to get longer and longer, and the frequency, in other words, number of links per unit length will be lower. And so we didn't need to do the Harvard Tower experiment. We can predict predict uh, that all ropes coming out of the Earth going upwards should have a uh, lower frequency. That's the prediction, prediction they call it, of uh, <clears throat> the rope model. 
Okay, here we have another one, which is the perihelion shift, and this is the one that gave Einstein his gold medal, right? In other words, this is the one that uh, he was able to, that they were able to prove uh, in 1919, and he was able to calculate uh, to a higher degree than Newton uh, the, this shifting of the perihelion, of Mercury's perihelion. In other words, what you see is there's a shifting as you go along. It tra the orbits of Mercury trace a Rosetta-like pattern when it moves around the sun. That was the finding, okay? And the issue was not that. The issue was the numbers for the, all these mathematicians. They say, oh, Einstein is more accurate than Newton. So his theory is correct and Newton is wrong. And then he had a different mechanism, which was space-time warpage, where Newton said it, did it with particles. And they couldn't really understand it with particles, but they said, oh, but if space-time is out there and it's warped, we can understand that. But they don't understand that space-time is not a physical object. It's an abstract mathematical concept, and you cannot bend concept. So their physical interpretation is totally irrational. Okay, okay so uh, here we have a planet falling through curved space. Okay, and watch this. And this is what they say is happening with uh, Mercury. Essentially, it's uh, following curved space, you know? So because of that, uh, Einstein got his medal. In fact, uh, here uh, we have the newspaper from the day that Eddington uh, gave Einstein his gold medal. There is it, okay? Found it. Einstein wins tic-tac-toe gold medal, right? And so uh, he had this equation. He won the tic-tac-toe contest, I guess. So, yeah, it was Eddington who made Einstein famous by proving, by demonstrating, you know, whatever they call it in uh, mathematics, uh, proving that uh, space, time, especially time, is warped. Seconds are warped. You figure it out. Okay, there are more modern tests of general relativity, and here let's go through them real quickly. The first one is the gravity probe B, okay, and this is NASA, uh, sent a probe in the 1970s and proved the lens clearing frame drag effect. They're saying that um, uh, when the Earth spins, it drags time around itself. Okay, that's what it was all about. Celestial objects that drag time around as it spins, and these were the mission objectives from NASA. Uh, Gravity Probe B is a NASA's physics mission to experimentally investigate the geodetic, the geodetic uh, effect, the uh, amount by which the Earth warps the local space-time in which it resides, and the frame-dragging effect, the amount by which the rotating Earth drags its local space-time around with it. Okay. Uh. Give me a second here. Okay, so um, what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about this. This was uh, put in by Brain Green, okay, and uh, he uh, illustrated what these people were up to. Here it goes. Watch carefully. For over a year, Gravity Probe B orbited the Earth while NASA monitored whether the Earth would actually twist space. The data began to trickle in. And there was a problem. The gyroscopes were experiencing a tiny, unexpected wobble, and to clean up the data would cost millions. Over the next two years, the problem with the data was solved, revealing that the axis of the gyroscope shifted by almost exactly the amount predicted by Einstein's equations. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is this. Uh, let's remove all the other garbage that uh, Brian Green put in there, and uh, let's just leave the arrow pointing, which is really a, a, what we want to know. What is it? What are those? Uh, what's that grid? What is that stuff? Uh, perhaps it's warp number lines? Is that what they're showing there? Warp number lines? So, so the question is, what moved what, what came in contact with the gyroscopes? 
And this is the question that they never answered because they're giving us a physical interpretation. They're saying they went out there and ran an experiment, right? Where, the, where whatever was out there, in other words, uh, time was touching something in the gyroscopes. And they're saying that this warp time is what moved the gyroscopes. Because now they cannot say, well, that's just our, phys our way of saying this. They cannot get away with that because now they ran an experiment, a hands-on experiment. Now they're using see and touch. They're using a detector. And they're saying, look, something moved the gyroscopes. No problem. If something moved the gyroscopes, tell us what it is. And certainly it cannot be number lines, which is, which is their conclusion. So we have a problem because these people are trying to get away with murder. They're saying, on the one hand, we're going to run a test. See, if you do it on the board and you just calculate stuff and then give a presentation, say, well, we predict this. This is what we think happened. But when you're doing an experiment, spending you know millions of dollars sending this probe up there, right, with these gyroscopes, which they took many years to build, to polish, to make them perfectly round, they send them out there. First, they fudge the data because there was a problem with the data. So they say, well, let's clean that up, which is what they were trying to <laughs> prove, you know, that uh, there should be no wobble. And then there was a wobble, an expected wobble. And they said, well, let's get rid of that data, you know. So I guess they stabilized the gyroscopes. Okay, fine. And now what? Now they say, well, something moved the gyroscopes. Something came in contact with the gyroscope. Okay, let's concede. No problem. And what came in contact with the gyroscope? Was it time or was it space? And this is the problem. These people say it's warp space-time, which is warp number lines. Warp number lines cannot have an effect on gyroscopes. Believe me. Okay? Please believe me. Okay, uh, there's, there's another one, another uh, modern proof. It's got a little bit to do with special relativity, but it's got to do also with, you know, the general relativistic notion of gravity affecting uh, both light and uh, time. Right? And here it is. Time passes more slowly in a stronger gravitational field. And uh, that's not true. And uh, I proved the opposite, you know, proof, evidence. There you see it on the right. You can take your atomic clock to the top of the Eiffel Tower and leave its clone at the bottom, right? And they say, look, uh, according to our prediction, to our measurements, the clock on the top should run faster and the one on the bottom should run slower. And we're not as sophisticated. We did it with an hourglass, you know, with a sand clock. And we found out that uh, it's the opposite. Uh, the clock on the top, you know, is the slow clock because it's farther away from gravity. And remember, this is a gravitational clock, unlike the atomic clock that Einstein uses there. And when you go to the bottom, you find out it um, ticks faster. The grains fall faster because it's closer to the source of gravity. And so, yeah, all I can tell you is that uh, Einstein's prediction did not come true. Okay, so we debunked, disproved, whatever you want to call it. We showed that uh, his principle is irrational. And then here we have another confirmation of relativity. Okay, test to confirm, to reconfirm and confirm and whatever, uh, you know, Einstein's theory. It says in 2015, LIGO detects gravitational waves, whatever those are, ripples in the fabric of space-time. Oh, that's what they are. Allegedly generated by two black holes or neutron stars orbiting around each other. So they detected these gravitational waves that came all the way to Earth, and they said, oh, we know for a fact because of their power and et cetera, et cetera, that they came from the collision or the merging of two black holes or neutron stars. Okay, so uh, waves of what? I mean, here we're talking about physical again. We're not talking about just putting numbers and using and saying that, oh, we don't do this in, in uh, mathematical physics and theoretical physics. No, right now you're saying you ran an experiment, you detected something, we're touching something, and these people say they touched a wave. Well, you cannot touch a wave. Wave is a concept, wave is a mathematical concept. That's where the problem is here. And so the question is, if you did not touch a wave, or if you did touch a wave, you know, what is it that you touch? What is a wave? What, what is the mediator of the wave? You know, you can say, you, you can't say you touched a wave in, order, in, um, in physics when you go to the ocean. 
What you touched is water. It's called water, okay? And molecules, if you want, atoms. You didn't touch wave. Wave is the uh, uh, notion of ordinary speech, saying, oh, I touched the wave, I bathed in the waves, I swam through the waves. No, no, you can't talk like that in physics. That's okay, ordinary speech. In physics, you have to name the object, the thing, the mediator, uh, the substance, whatever you want to call it, yeah, the entity. You, you, if you go to the ocean, you touch water, you touch molecules, you touch atoms. All those words are valid. You cannot say you touch the wave. Like in, at AMD, we had the, the sign say, catch the wave. <laughs> catch the wave. Yeah, you can't catch the wave in physics. Okay, you can catch water, you can catch atoms, you can catch molecules or whatever you want to call it. You can catch fish, you know, when, when the ocean throws them to you. But you cannot catch concepts, you cannot catch fields, you cannot catch energy, you cannot catch waves. No, this is not a semantic argument. The semantic argument is the one that general relativity is introducing into science. Okay, that's the way it works. And so, yeah, uh, until they identify the physical object, they cannot say they detected gravitational waves. And uh, yeah, so just keep that in mind. Now, a lot of this is, has to do with the wording that mathematicians have created to get their theories across. And here we have uh, one last one here, the direct observation of black holes. They took a picture of this a couple years ago, and they say, oh, well, look, we took a picture of a black hole. And is that a black hole? And a lot of people just look at it casually and say, oh, okay, there's a black hole. I understand what that is. There's that dark region in the center, and uh, that's the black hole. Absolutely not. Okay, that's not a black hole. Black hole is um, a little dot in that center. And that dot is not even a dot. It's a, known as a singularity. And that singularity in that, uh, in that region has no size, has no diameter, has no radius, has no volume, has no shape. Singularity is nothing. It's the definition of nothing. And so it doesn't have infinite density. It has no density whatsoever because there's no volume there. And, uh, you know, and then the other problem with this is that uh, according to relativity, uh, the black hole crushes all matter out of existence. And if it crushes all matter out of existence, there is no matter. Mass is the quantity of matter or a measure of the quantity of matter. Therefore, this thingy called singularity doesn't have any mass either. So let's see, it has no size, no uh, radius, no diameter, no volume, no shape, no matter, no mass. That's the definition of nothing. But even if we were to com <laughs> concede all these things that does have mass, kilograms, how do kilograms move a star around itself? How does kilograms flay the outer skin of a star from far away? That's the mechanism they have to identify. To say that it, mass does it, they haven't said anything. Mass is a concept. Mass can't do anything in this world. Okay, and uh, so, yeah, when you get down to it, you say, well, how do they prove, you know, these, um, uh, this black hole? And here you have good old Nobel Prize, Reinhard, um, what was his name? Reinhard uh, uh, Genzel. Okay. And he says the following, he says, an unambiguous proof of the existence of a massive black hole as defined by general relativity requires the determination of the gravitational potential to the scale of the event horizon. Okay, this proof, proof, <laughs> can in principle be obtained from spatially resolved measurements of the motions of test particles, okay, in close orbit around the nucleus. In practice, it is not possible to probe the scale of an event horizon of any black hole candidate. Okay. A more modest goal then is to show that the gravitational potential of a galaxy nucleus is dominated by a compact non-stellar mass and that this central mass concentration cannot be anything but a black hole. And then he says, uh, later on, he says, the main result of our work is the proof of existence of an astrophysical massive black hole beyond any reasonable doubt. He thinks he's in a court of law saying, oh, it's beyond any reasonable doubt, and the only thing it could be is a black hole. 
so that's how they proved it. They proved it indirectly, and they prove it with mass, which is not a physical object. Mass is just a concept. Uh, black hole crushes all matter out of existence, and nevertheless, good old uh, Chandrasekhar proved mathematically that a uh, black hole crushes, uh, compresses, in other words, a star compresses completely to absolutely nothing, to zero volume, zero size. And uh, he got the Nobel Prize for proving that mathematically. Okay, so you figure that out. And now let's go with the ICN of Kate to uh, closing arguments here. We have good old Aini, okay? And what does good old Aini say? Uh, this is how he ended his days. I'm generally regarded as a sort of petrified object, rendered blind and deaf by the years. I have become an obstinate erratic in the eyes of my colleagues. And then he, in a letter he writes to uh, someone there, to Bezo, who says, uh, I'm sorry, to, yeah, to Bezo, one of his friends, right? All these 50 years of conscious brooding have brought me no near to the answer to the, answer to the question, what are like quanta? Nowadays, every Tom, Dick, and Harry thinks he knows it, but he is mistaken. I consider it quite possible that physics cannot be based on the field concept. What was, uh, what we were we talking about in the last hour for a field, right? On continuous structures. In that case, nothing remains of my entire castle in the air, gravitational theory included, and of the rest of modern physics. So this is how good old Aini ended up his days. Uh, and just to top it off, he didn't believe in black holes. He did not believe in Big Bang. He did not believe in gravitational waves. He wrote about this in, in a couple papers, by the way. And he did not believe or would not have believed in uh, dark matter and dark energy and none of that nonsense. Okay, so um, yeah, good old Aini, he's put as the poster boy for um, <laughs> for uh, general relativity when he ended his days not believing in any of that anyway.